everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 136. Now, today's show has probably been uh, one of the most anticipated shows when I've talked about it on social media. You know, I'm, I'm all for asking what people want to hear, what they want to discuss, and where education needs to evolve on this show. And this is a topic that I have briefly talked about before, um, but I haven't gone into any detail because I am by no means an expert and I will not give out advice that I'm not qualified to do so. So um, the topic of steroids and steroid usage is something that is probably very PC, it's closed doors, um, no one really talks that openly about it. So I'm hoping today is going to be a very frank, very open conversation and to join me on the show, um, I welcome Dave Crossland. Hello. Hello. Um, I did, that is your name, I've just got it right, haven't I? I haven't... Yes, yes. I haven't I haven't angered a twenty stone man before I've even started. You've angered me by calling me twenty stone. I'm twenty six. <laughs> <laughs> okay, granted. Um, Dave, um, help me out here, buddy. If, for people that don't know who you are, um, who are you? What what's kind of your role in the world of fitness? <laughs> oh, oh God, <laughs> I'll try and keep it clean. Um, my official job role is what's known as a performance and image enhancing drugs specialist. So basically what I do for a living is I deal with steroid use and steroid abuse. I do presentations to serving soldiers, to RF, RF personnel. I train police officers in steroid use. I work in the court systems, both defense and prosecution as an expert witness. I do projects with the National Steroid Research Centre based out of John Moore's University Hospital in Liverpool. I train harm reduction workers and needle exchange workers. And I dish out a fair bit of advice online via Facebook and various other things. I have my own. I did a documentary 18 months ago tracking my last big cycle. Um, it's a mixed review thing because I'm not the leanest and a lot of people don't really regard me as a bodybuilder because I carry quite high percentage of body fat. Um, but it was not even something I ever claimed to be. It was just a case of showing what life was like at that size using those sort of dosages and the ups and downs of doing so. Sure. It was never going to be a use steroids or don't use steroids. I'm not pro-use. I'm not against use. I'm just pro-education. Nice. It's your life. It's your choice. But if you're going to do something, educate yourself. Don't be ignorant and then start bitching to everyone afterwards that the drugs fucked you up. The drugs have never fucked anybody up. The person using the drugs fucked themselves up. You know, your drugs don't enter your system on their own accord. You have to take them. So therefore, it's you that causes the damage by doing that. So if you're going to take a potentially harmful substance, educate yourself. And that's what I've always been about. Honesty, openness and education. Unfortunately, you're in an industry where... I've seen some very big natties in my time, let's put it that way. <laughs> you know, and it's like, when you actually start, and this is the other thing as well, though, with steroid use of people in this country. People admit to using, oh, it's going, oh, it's going great, brilliant. And you'll speak to them in forums, online, and on, on pages on Facebook, and then you get a message half an hour later, I've really got problems with this, and I've really got problems with that. So why were you, half an hour ago, telling everybody that your cycle was going great and you feel like 10, 10 men, if you can't get a harbour back there and you've got massive mood swings, be honest. Mm. Because you're not helping people by lying about what the drugs are doing to you. Mm. If you're honest and people know what to expect, and if they know what to expect, they know when to recognise that problems are forming. Okay, so on a personal level, why did you start taking steroids? Mm, I, I started training when I was 15. Mm -hmm. Typical fat kid not very strong, played rugby at school, wanted to improve my strength. I trained and I was a staunch natty until I was 19. I didn't have any issue with other people using, but it was definitely not for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I've always had problems with body fat levels. I eventually dieted down for a show as a natural. And once I'd done that, there was nowhere else to go. I mean, you're going back... 25 years, the night divisions weren't what they were now. Uh, and there was just nowhere, there was nothing else. And I'd been, I, I trained in a, a hardcore gym. At the time, I was very friendly with uh, a guy called Billy Payne, who was trained with Dorian quite a bit. 
also a guy called Kev Trey who was a multiple British champion, and his girlfriend at the time was a, a female pro called Marianne Gay. So I was well aware of the steroid world and steroid use. Mm -hmm. And I just, after I died for that show, I burnt myself out. I mean, I, I started dying, I was 23 stone a chalk. I stepped on stage at 14 stone three. Oh my God. Six months later, and I was fucked. I mean, I was dead. Mm. And I had a massive rebound afterwards, and, and I didn't train, and I was just burnt out. And when I got back to it, I thought, you know what, sod it. I'm going to use them. Now, I'd always had this ethos. That when I started training, I thought the difference between me and the guys in the magazines was how hard they trained. So I'd had already developed this very good ethic about hard work in the gym. So when I did take, I just exploded. Mm -hmm. um, but I was naive, didn't really know what I was doing. I used to go to the guy where I got my gear, and he was like, what you got was good this month. And that's what I took. There was no structure to my cycles. I did tend to base around one or two injectables and possibly one oral, and that was it. And just by chance, the doses weren't particularly high. I didn't know anything about PCT, didn't know anything about endodontic shutdown, didn't know anything about liver support, didn't know anything about any of the problems, cholesterol damage or anything. And I actually stayed on cycle for four years. Wow. <laughs> which the only thing I did do, which was good, but I did this, I don't know even know really why I did it. I did run HCG in the background throughout. So when I did eventually come off, um, the damage wasn't as catastrophic as it could have been. Okay. And I did make a full recovery. I came off due to tearing my left pet completely off. Ouch. Uh, and basically, I had lots of other things going on in my life uh, at a business that was getting successful, but, but relationship problems and all sorts. And when I told me, I mean, when I told me Peck, I was prepping for the British, and I might be blowing my own trumpet now, but I did have a chance of at least taking a British title, if not taking a pro card at some stage. And uh, I was 24 years old, I was 24 and a half stone, and I had abs starting to show. I mean, they weren't in, but you could see where they were supposed to be. Yeah. I was one big, strong boy. And that's all I dreamed of. So when that happened, my head went to pieces. I ended up with depression. I didn't train. I came off cycle. Uh, I didn't run any PCT. I didn't do anything. But luckily, like I said, more by error and good luck than anything else, running the HCG in the background meant that my recovery wasn't as dramatic as it got, as ter terrifying as it would have been, even though I did it naturally. But I didn't train for 12 years after that. 12 year break yeah 12 year break wow so okay that spurs the question of why you came back what was the impetus um i had hit 27 stone of fat ouch <laughs> 54 inch waist i think it was and i was i'd made a quite a lot of mistakes in my life that resulted in me being uh the legal departments of this country being interested in my welfare <laughs> Uh, and as a result of that, I had found myself abroad. And I was actually in Canada at the time, and I was helping a friend working on his truck, and the jack stands gave go, and the truck fell on top of me. Uh, the paramedics brought me back. I did technically die. And those sort of experiences have a very strange effect on how you, you look at things. Mm. And I just took stock of, my, stock of my life, and I thought, what am I doing? I'm a fat mess, I'm miserable, I'm unhappy in my relationship, I'm unhappy in my life, I've got criminal charges I need to deal with that I'm hiding from, and it was just a catalyst to start and change a lot of different things. And one of them, the first thing I could change was my weight. Mm -hmm. So I started dieting, I then ended up at the authorities' will, and that found me in prison, but then again, I was in an environment where I could control myself, I could train. Mm -hmm. Or I couldn't control my diet very well because, unfortunately, you get what you get. But I could make healthy choices as best I could, and I could at least get into a gym. So I started training. Um, and when I finished my sentence, I came out. I continued natural for about six, seven months, and then I started back on the gym. At the time, the intention was to go into strongman because I thought there's no point going on the bodybuilding stage. Now I'm disfigured because mm -hmm. my left pec is still detached to this day. Okay. Um, but I soon discovered that Big fat palms and short fingers don't make good strong men because you don't have a good grip and you mm -hmm. can't hold on to things. Mm -hmm. and, and Alvin Small, um, I opened a gym in Carlisle and Alvin Small came up to help 
opening. We did a big open day. We had Andy Bolton, Alvin Small, uh, Sean Davis. Mm -hmm. They all came up for the day. And uh, Alvin started nagging at me. You need to compete, you need to compete, you need to compete. And I'd lost all belief in myself for doing anything like that. Anyway, he said, look, I'll help you prep. Let's go for it. So I started dieting. It was a two and a half year diet, really, effectively. <laughs> uh, Why so long? <laughs> well, it was. It wasn't so much. No, not quite. So probably a two year diet, to be fair. Um, I was big, but I was fat, mm -hmm. and we just took it down nice and steady, nice and steady, nice and steady. And I just never really dropped into the proper gear to diet for a show. And then I finally said, right, okay, this year is going to be the year we're going to do it. I started dieting properly doing the car, doing everything to do, and I just stalled. Most everything just came to a crashing halt. And I was sat at 310 pounds. I had abs, but the calipers said 10, 11%. I don't believe them. I think I was more, but that's what the calipers were showing at the time. Carrying quite a lot of water, though. Uh, but I just I just burnt out. I stalled. I couldn't get any more off. I tried it. We tried everything. Even DMP didn't work. I actually gained a pound with DMP. <laughs> uh, and... At the time, I was sponsored by SSN, and I'd been speaking to Sean Bushby, who was the UK distributor, and we'd had a conversation about Rich Piano at Body Power and how he had such a massive audience because he was open about his use. Mm -hmm. And he said, your next book, you want to do it live? He said, we'll get behind it with one of the brands from SSN. The one they were thinking of was Muscle Junkie, uh, and we'll do a big, almost like they've done with Rich Piano, sort of promo over in the UK. And I said, yeah, okay, I'm up for that because it works well with what I'm doing with harm prevention as well. I can use it as an educational tool and everything else. Uh, and um, anyway, SSN balked on the idea. They panicked and said, no, they couldn't be associated with it. And I thought, you know what, bollocks to it, I'm going to do it anyway. And I just decided that, you know what, I wasn't competing for me anymore. I was competing because everybody else would want to see what I looked like. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do it. And the day, I, the, the day I made the decision that I wasn't dieting anymore, I didn't go out and have a massive binge, but the pressure relief was amazing. Mm. And I just thought, I'm going to do what I enjoy now. I'm going to do what I want to do, sod what people think. I do this because I enjoy it, and it's hard enough as it is without doing it if you don't enjoy it. Mm. And what I enjoy doing is training hard and getting big. So that's what I did. I love that. I love that, that you've got to a point that it's all about you because, uh, and we've talked about this loads on my podcast, that the fitness industry is rife with people that have goals from other people's perceptions mm. or beliefs and no one's actually looking internally and saying, actually, what do I want? Um, and this is especially true with people who want to be super ripped and super lean, that they, they just think that is the journey. They think because mm. all the models have got that as their Facebook cover profile picture, that you haven't succeeded until you get to that. There's also, I mean, you see guys on Facebook. Um, obviously, I've got a lot of bodybuilders on my feed. And it's off-season, sick of being fat, sick of eating, not liking this, can't wait to diet. Then four weeks later, fucking starving, can't wait for off-season, going to make massive gains this year. Oh, it was a shit result. What are you doing it for? <laughs> you know, I haven't heard one nice thing come out of your mouth all year. Mm. Everything's a problem. If if that if this lifestyle is making you that miserable, seriously, have a long talk to yourself. You need to go do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I surprisingly, considering the level of my body fat, my diet is extremely tight. But I work well that way. I just eat too much. It's mm -hmm. not that I eat the wrong stuff. I just eat too much of the good stuff. Mm -hmm. But I enjoy I mean, I've been sidelined with injuries since September, and it's been the most frustrating thing I've ever had to deal with in a long time because it's the training that I love. Mm. It's pushing myself in the gym. The, the, don't get me wrong, I like being big, but it's more that's more a side effect. Mm. What I love is the battle with me and the weights and beating myself in the gym. That's the element of training that I absolutely adore. Amazing. And that's always been my passion. All right. Well, let's, let's take this show into some specifics. Um, yeah. But let's let's go back to basics because there's a huge amount of people scratching their head about what even steroids are. So, what are steroids? Well, there's several different classifications, and the most people, the one that the most people that haven't had much experience with will be familiar with, will be cortisol steroids, which is the sort of thing that a doctor gives you for a dicky shoulder. Okay. Uh, what we're referring to is anabolic steroids. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, you'll hear two main references with steroids. You'll hear anabolic and androgenic. And but keeping it nice and simple for those 
that don't know a lot. Anabolic refers to its muscle building properties. Mm -hmm. And androgenic refers to its strength and its size, its male characteristic properties. Okay. So the higher the and a drug is androgenic, the more strength based it's going to be, but the more sides you're going to get from that drug. Uh, the more anabolic a drug is, the ideal study would be 100% anabolic, but as yet there's not been one invented. Not a strength that's effective anyway. Okay. Okay. So um, looking at it from a building muscle perspective, because this is what is being largely used, I assume, in the feet physique domain, what mm -hmm. different types of steroids exist? I suppose I'm talking about individual compounds and types. There's, for building there's loads. Muscles. There's 250 registered pharmaceutical steroids that are available. Wow. Okay. Um, there's hundreds more that have been developed and have never found a marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, you have three basic classifications, testosterone based, nandrolones, and I'm sorry, but the third escapes me for now. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, brain's gone fuzzy, can't think. So <laughs> <laughs> that's all a mental block. But um, there are lots. I mean, the common ones that you'll hear people talk about are test based products, they'll either be testosterone or testosterone blends. So you've got test prop, test nth, test sit. They're the three main duration test easters. And then you've got sustenone, which is a blend. T400 is a common one, which is a blend of uh, different test esters. Uh, your Nandrolone family includes DECA, NPP, which is fast-acting DECA, Trembolone. And then you've got drugs like Equipoise, Masteron. Um, there's, there is a massive plethora when you start getting into it, and there's all sorts of different variations of it was starting, trend methylates, suspensions, you've got the orals, Anavar, Dynavol, Oxymethylone, Winstrel, Winstrel's also injectable, Dynavol's also injectable. There's a lot. Okay. It can get quite complex. And I think that's what confuses a lot of people because you've not just got the base drug like testosterone. You have actually probably got something in the region of about 12 different esters of testosterone. And an ester is the speed at which that drug half-life activates within the body so okay. function like propanate has a 48 to 72 hour half-life which means if you take 100 milligram on a monday by wednesday you can have 50 milligram left in your system that's active mm -hmm. while testanthinate's 14 days so if you take 100 milligram on the monday in 14 days you're going to have 50 milligrams that's still active in your system sure uh if you take something like a um, backlight you're looking at i think it's about 60 days half-life oh, okay I mean, it's not used in bodybuilding terms. Um, so you've got that level, all those different ACEs, and then you've got different, obviously you've got the different classifications of drug, and nandrolones work in a different way to what testosterone will. Equipoise and mastron don't even affect test levels. They don't affect test levels at all. EQ will increase RBC, red blood cell count massively. So they all, they all have their own different properties. They all work in different ways. They all have different androgenic to um, anabolic ratios. Trembolone's androgenic ratio is about 2,700, while test prop is about 100. Okay. So um, they all have, but most people won't even get involved in that. What most people's experience of steroids is that you take this drug with this drug and this drug, and that's it. So yeah. you'll take Sus, Decker, and Devo. Okay. You'll take Test and Trent. Okay. You know, there's, there's certain groupings that have been popular throughout history, and that's how people base their drug use on. Not, probably 80% of users haven't got a clue what half the drugs actually do, sure. let alone what the side effects and dangers and, and things to watch for are. Because from my experience, when people make that decision, they go and ask someone who's currently taking it, and he says, I'm taking X, Y, and Z, you take X, Y, and Z, but I'd start at this dose and work up to this, for example. Yeah, it's quite common if you're lucky that that's sensible. Yeah. We'll, we'll go and say, right, I want to look like him. He's taking this, so that must mean that's what I have to take. Okay. Without any real experience of, of how the drugs work and how the receptor situation works within the body. You see, through our body, we have antigen receptors. Mm -hmm. Now, we only have one, one type, that is, not one receptor. <laughs> uh, and if you have... When you have steroids in your system, your body will actually start to produce more androgen receptors. Okay. 
in order to cope with the increase of the hormone. Mm -hmm. But it needs estrogen in order to do this. And because a lot of people want to stay lean and ripped all the time and have low water retention, they oversuppress their estrogen levels. Now, this has quite severe health implications, but one of the things it does do is it suppresses androgen receptor upload, up, up regulation, which means you don't get more androgen receptors. Got you. Now, the reason why a starter would take 5, if he took 5G, doesn't grow like me when I take 5G, is because he hasn't got the receptors there to utilize the drug. Because I've been using for years, I've increased the number of receptors in my body. Mm -hmm. So now I can use higher doses effectively, whereas in the past, if I'd used them, I'd have wasted half the gear. Okay. So that's why when you get these guys that start on these high courses, they don't respond in what you'd expect them to respond to that high cost because they're just, there's too much there. Sure. And the other thing is then the size get quite high and then what will happen is they'll also start feeling rough and then they don't have the energy in the gym because they don't feel very well. So the, the training will start to suffer because they're struggling with the sides and ill health because of it. <clears throat> so it can affect them in two ways. Okay. You mentioned um, androgenic and anabolic. Do would, So let's talk about the bodybuilder because um, I think this is what people in the gym are aspiring to and looking at. Mm -hmm. Would you mix the androgenic and the anabolic together because it, it also has a it basically has a concomitant effect? Yes. I mean, generally most drugs have a ratio of both anyway. Okay. Like testosterone is 100 of each, so it's fairly middle of the road. Okay. Um, but what, what, what I did want is high androgenics pre-workout because it increases your strength and then a baseline of anabolics underneath because they're recovery and growth. Got you. So that would be the ideal situation. Okay. Uh, but with high androgenics come high sides and that's where the bit where people struggle. Okay. <laughs> so as a whole, I want to explore, I think it's important we talk about both the benefits and the negatives. Um, what, as a whole, do we see as the positives from steroids used in the right way? Uh, generally, most people will report a feeling of well-being. Uh, drugs like decadurabolin actually increase your immune system. But unfortunately, stuff like testosterone actually decreases your immune system. So depending on the drug, depending on whether you'll have a change in your immune balance. Okay. Um, obviously, you get increased strength. You get uh, your body comes into an nitrogen positive state, which means you absorb protein more efficiently, and you're growing. Now, the biggest boost for most people is because they get this feeling of greater confidence, this feeling of greater well-being. They have more confidence in themselves. They have a better self-perception of themselves, mm -hmm. and so therefore they feel better about themselves. Most people don't choose to use anabolic steroids because they're happy with the way they look. Sure. So. Anything that improves that, and depending on how severe an issue they feel that is, is going to improve their quality of life. Um, so the main benefits are based around the results. Sure. However, and it varies from person to person, but a lot of people report that they do feel better. They recover faster. They, they knock off knocks and bumps a lot easier, only a, a, a slightly better version of themselves okay. when it comes to physical, physically I'm talking here. Okay. Um, would you say that part of the problem with any kind of, I suppose, ongoing, we'll call it potential abuse, stems from the people that have maybe entered into using steroids for the wrong reasons initially? Yeah, I mean, well, let's get one thing straight for a start. It's all abuse. Okay. None of us are using these drugs how they were intended to be used. So we're all abusing them. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a pharmaceutical um, hormone replacement therapy guideline for testosterone is 250 milligrams every 10 to 14 days. You know, even guys who are running low cruise doses run 250 a week. Yeah. So it's all abuse. That's the first thing. Um, sorry, I've forgotten the question. Um, <laughs> do we see a lot of the problems with people basically that start steroid usage for the wrong reasons? So maybe the, the body image, yes. the dysmorphia, 
Not so much in, in the physical side effects. Well, it varies. Um, the psychological issues are bigger. You Steroids in the whole are not chemically addictive. There is some evidence to show that nandrolones will affect the D1 dopamine receptor, which means you can suffer from low mood or mild depression post-usage. Mm -hmm. But the biggest addiction with steroids is the psychological one. You get trapped into this link that you can't grow if you're not on. Yeah. And you, in severe cases, you'll get trapped into this link that you are a, a you are not a good person if you are not on. You are a weaker version of you. You are not good enough if you're not on. So the steroids become the crux uh, for your insecurities. They become the band aid that fixes your insecurities. So instead of you dealing with your self image and learning to accept you. Are, and then be positive about changing those in a positive way, what happens is you don't accept who you are and you become reliant on the drug to patch the problem that you've got psychologically, which is your body image. Also, when you're talking with people that have either insecurity issues or um, fear issues and have taken them for that sort of thing, you know, maybe I was bullied all my life because I was a skinny little run, and so I'm taking them, I'm going to be big and I'm going to show the bullies what to do. Now, steroids don't, roid rage is a media myth. It doesn't really exist. However, what they will do is they'll intensify the sort of person you already are. Mm. Now, if you have underlying issues with anger, but you've always been too scared to express them because you've always been picked on by everybody, so you resent the world and everybody in it, you throw steroids into that mix and suddenly you're going to get someone who's a very angry person who's quite vocal about it as well. Mm. Now, what they do do is they increase white matter buildup in the brain. Now, white matter is responsible for our reactions. It, it's about how we react. So though steroids don't increase your potential aggression, they will increase the rate at which you react to stimulus. Got yeah. And that's where I think a lot of this roid rage myth has come from because people, if someone's reacting faster to a stimulus... Then you can say, well, fucking hell, what's wrong with him? He's going off his head. Yeah. No, the reaction's the same, it's just happened quicker. Did you um, when 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 you've been going through your various cycles, have you experienced any of these negative side effects? And have you have they taken you astray, or were you kind of almost big enough to stand back and go, Whoa, hang on, I can see what's going on here? Um I've never really suffered from aggression issues. Uh, if anything, they chilled me out. I was quite aggressive when I was in my younger years and the, the, the steroids sort of mellowed me out because I felt more confidence. I didn't feel the need to be aggressive to assert myself. Nice, okay. So with, with me, they had more of the opposite effect where before I was aggressive because I was insecure, I felt threatened. So it was like, you know, um, attack is the best defense. Mm -hmm. When I was on gear... I felt very confident in my capabilities and I felt very confident in dealing with any situation that arose. So therefore I was no longer really ag openly aggressive because I didn't need to be. However, I have, without doubt, had times where I have, and not really consciously, slipped into almost a dependency mode where I've not wanted to stop because I was a fear of losing gains uh, and there's been occasions, definitely, where, I mean, I've more or less gone through it just recently. When I was injured back in September, I was just starting to bring my levels up for my next cycle. I dropped them back down, but I didn't drop them down low enough because I was thinking, oh, this injury will be going soon, this injury will be going soon. And it never did. And a week turned into a month, and a month turned into two months, and two months turned into six months. Uh, and I kept talking myself out of coming back down low because I was thinking, well, if I keep them a bit higher, it'll make up for the poor training I'm doing at the moment because I'm injured and I can't do it. Mm. And really, it was, it was stupid because all that happened was I got run down. I didn't suffer any real medical issues in the sense of ill health, like of liver problems or kidney problems or anything like that, but my whole body just got run down. And I was got to the stage where, you know what, I've got to come off anyway. Yeah. Because it's just not doing me any good, isn't it? So yeah, I have fallen into that trap myself, and it's very easily done because it becomes so that you just forget. 
it just becomes part of life. You know, you just tech and you tech and you tech. Sure. And then when you remove that, it's like, oh, shit, I haven't got that crux anymore. I'm not on. I'm not on. Uh, but I, as well, I think there's a problem with it. it depends on your level of development as well. Because see, if you're still under your genetic potential, then there's every reason why with good training and good diet, you'll hold pretty much all your gains. Yeah. If you're above your genetic potential, then there's no way you're going to hold those gains naturally and you will lose sight. Okay. Because your body can't sustain them naturally. It needs the chemicals in order to sustain them because it needs the chemical for the, the protein absorption and everything else. Okay. So when when you have someone that you're working with that has this feedback loop of the self-confidence issues, it, it's making them feel like a different person, do you try to coach them through that scenario or are you saying are you referring them to some kind of therapist to help them work through this because it is a it's a deep rooted issue right yeah it, it is uh, but i also think it's probably a more common issue in modern society than we realize oh definitely um i i don't claim to be a therapist in any way shape or form and i will advise them the best i can but i'm always very honest and look you know i am a therapist and i can't deal with problems from your childhood or problems from your school days. If, if, if you're telling me that you've got issues based on poor relationships, whatever it may be, then all I can suggest is that you go see a counsellor. What I'm telling you, though, is that by throwing this amount of drugs in with that problem, it is not an advisable mix. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll always, I mean, I, I deal with one guy who um, has severe personality disorders very severe mm-hmm. uh, but what he's found is that when he uses gear he can control his problem but I, like, and I do help him with his cycles but like I say to him you've got to keep your doctor informed of everything you're doing mm-hmm. I work with another guy who is suffering from a terminal illness and he uses and his attitude is, well, I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out with a bang, which is fair enough. <laughs> but he does tell his specialist everything he's doing. Yeah. And the funny thing is, with him, he's now reduced his alternative medication to such low doses, his specialist is like, well, I don't understand why your pain meds are so low. Mm. You know, I don't care what you're doing. Whatever you're doing, it's actually doing you the world of good. Yeah. Because these are the chemicals that you're having to take for pain are far worse than what you're taking. Yeah. So it's I I will advise to the limits of my ability and I will advise as a friend and a human being. But if I feel there's serious problems, I'll say, look, you need to sort yourself out. There are serious, and I'm honest, I don't I don't fanny around with people when it comes to, you know, look, I'm not gonna be saying look, this is the situation. You can hate me or love me for it, but yeah. you're, you're nuts, mate. You need to go get some help. Yeah. If you're not careful, you're going to find yourself sitting in a prison cell because you've killed somebody. Okay, so outside, we've already discussed inadvertently quite a few of, we'll call it the downsides rather than the negatives. Is there anything that we haven't talked about? There's masses. Okay, go. Um, The biggest single health issue with steroid use is probably the most neglected health issue with steroid use, and that's lipids. Okay. LDL, HDL, your cholesterols. You see, all steroids, it doesn't matter which one you take, it doesn't matter oral or injectable, it doesn't matter anabolic or androgenic, it doesn't matter. They all reduce good cholesterol and increase your bad cholesterol. Wow, okay. Now, over sustained periods of usage, that's going to cause one and one thing only, and that's going to cause the buildup of plaque. Mm. You throw in a shitty diet on top of that, which unfortunately a large percentage of users now do have, and you are creating a problem that could be with you for the rest of your life. Okay. Now, everyone in steroid use talks about going and get your bloods done. And yet you do get your lipids checked, so you know what your cholesterol levels are, and you'll get your liver values checked, you'll get your kidney function checked, you get your RBC checked, creatine serums and everything else. But... That won't tell you if you've got plaque buildup. Yeah. 
Notice I've got plaque buildup as an angiogram. It's a semi-surgical procedure. So you can't go to GP and say, I want my plaque levels checking. Yeah. So unfortunately, you might find when you hit 45 or 50 that you suddenly have an heart attack or some cardiac issues because of plaque or a narrowing of the arteries and you need a shunt or whatever it may be. And you will never associate that that could have been caused by the fact that you were using gear when you were 20 to 25 years old. And it's the area that most people just are aware of and completely neglect because it doesn't have a direct feedback almost. Yeah. You know, if you're taking shitloads of orals and your liver's caught having problems, you're going to know about it because you're going to go jaundice. Mm-hmm. Um, but with your plaque, chances are those problems won't become problems until you're a lot older. Um, now, the product that I've always used is a product called Lipis the bill uh, and it maintaining healthy lipid levels okay. and it's one area that say, say it, that again sorry you broke up a little it's got, the product is called lipid stabil okay and it's, it's brilliant for maintaining lipid levels and if anyone is thinking of using steroids or is using steroids in my opinion they should be using that product i think sales of that product just went up <laughs> well, I don't know for mission, but at the end of the day, if it keeps people safe yeah. and if they're not finding themselves in the cardiac unit in 20 years' time, it's worth it. Mm. The problem is, you see, you can go buy a bottle of test for 35 quid. When I give you the list of supplements you need to take to protect your body while you're using gear, you're going to be spending another 200 quid. Oh, hang on a minute. The course is only costing me 70 or 100. Why the hell am I spending this extra 200 quid and all this crap? Mm. Bollocks to that, I'll just take the gear. And that's people's attitudes towards it. Yeah, yeah. Other health I- issues, most studies will increase your RBC, your red blood cell count. So it increases your nutritional transit. Um, oxymethylone orals and EQ are probably the two main ones for doing this because that's what those drugs are actually designed to do. Mm-hmm. Now, this can increase your blood pressure. Now, it might not increase your blood pressure to a point where it's medically high, but increase it beyond, above and beyond what's normal. As a result of this, your heart wall will thicken. On top of this, testosterone reduces heart elasticity. So you're going to be in a situation where that big pump in the center of your body starts getting a little bit stiff and not as flexible as it used to be. Now, everyday life, it isn't going to cause you a problem. If you get into an extreme circumstance where you're pushing your BP 180 plus and it's not used to go in there, it can be quite painful. Now, the reason I've always advocated cycling is because when you come off, your blood pressure returns to normal and your heart will atrophy. So the heart wall will start to thin back down. So it stops things from getting out of control. Okay. Um, other areas of concern, um, obviously liver function. Now, generally with most steroids, they're not overly liver toxic. Uh, it's mainly particularly oral, some suspensions as well. Um, and to be fair, to be honest, they're probably no worse than going out on the weekend and getting, having a few bevies. Mm. But if you're going out on the weekend and having a few bevies as well, and doing a few lines of Charlie as well, then we're going to have serious problems. The best product there is out there for um, liver control is TUDCA or UDCA. Um, And they have seen, though there's not been clinically studies, I've seen shitloads of self-diagnostics that have uh, shown massive liver value reduction using those products. Okay. Uh, I mean, I brought my own down. My own was sitting at 180, which is relatively high, but at the time I'd been using large amounts of painkillers as well because of my injury. And I brought my own down with TDCA to sub 80s. So it was a really effective yeah, product. Yeah, impressive. Um, a lot of people go on about kidney damage. Now, kidney damage doesn't really occur with steroid use, it's more with diuretics or with high protein diets or with poor hydration. Okay. There are a few isolated cases of kidney issues related to steroid use, but they're normally related to associated drugs as opposed to steroids of natural self. Steroids of natural self have very little effect on the kidneys. Um, Other sides, I mean, sidewise, you're talking male pattern baldness, and people go on about, well, it's DHT, which is um, 
testosterone converts to DHT when it enters your system and it makes it more powerful, but it's not DHT at all, to be honest. If you're susceptible to hair loss, you're going to get hair loss and taking DHT products, non-DHT products is going to make no difference whatsoever. Mm. Um, acne, um, the steroids will activate the receptors within the oil producing glands of the skin and you can get overly oily skin mm -hmm. and therefore acne. Uh, unfortunately, if you get progesterone size, if you get elevated levels of progesterone, progesterone actually tightens the pores as well. So you end up with large amounts of oil stuck underneath the skin, which can turn into quite nasty pussy boil type zits. Oof. Uh, progesterone acne is probably a lot worse than standard test acne. Okay. Um, high estrogen levels will cause, obviously gyno is the common one, uh, water retention and female fat deposits. So you'll hold fat in those sort of areas. Okay. Uh, most people that say they have gyno don't. What they have is the precursor to gyno, which is swelling around the nipple. Uh, however, estrogen plays a very important role in the body. Not only, not only does it help with androgen, regular up, and androgen receptor up regulation that we already discussed, but it helps, uh, helps manage healthy cholesterol. So you need estrogen in your body. Mm. And you will not grow without estrogen in your body as well. So I don't like the use of products like letrozole, which is a very strong anti-aromatization agent uh, because it pretty much shuts down all estrogen production. Personally, I prefer to run something a little bit milder and then run an estrogen blocker, a CERM, selective estrogen receptor modulator, will block the receptor. Therefore, you don't get the estrogen side effects in the way of war retention or fat retention, but the estrogen is still in your system to act upon your liver to help control your lipids. Sure. Um, other sides, there's all sorts of little individual odd ones. Um, Trembolone is a particularly nasty drug. It's an androlone, but it's a particularly harsh one. Uh, it's a very popular drug because it is so powerful. But apart from the dopamine receptor issues where you can get depression post usage, it will also damage brain cells. And nandrolones in general will mutate spermicides. However, if you take taurine, it actually prevents that. Oh. Um, there's, all, so there's, there's all sorts of little bits and bats. Sure, trying sure. to find the more generalizations. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't think we need to micromanage everything because uh, we could probably, because, you know, everyone's got very individual physiology. And it's yeah, going to yeah. react. Surprisingly. So, I mean, one of the things that people don't look at is actually the, the predisposition to muscle tears. Oh, okay. See, two main causes of muscle tears, um, accelerated strength and poor hydration. Mm -hmm. There is some studies that show links to antibiotics that may have also caused as well. Now, if you're taking, and this is aimed at a particular group of users, and uh, we all know who they are, they're the young lads that uh, wear skinny jeans, don't train legs, um, go out on the weekend on the piss with a, they've got one sleeve of tattoo, they've got a shirt cut down to the belly button. Have <laughs> a look. <laughs> uh, and um, they're hamming the gear all week and they're out on the piss all weekend. Yep. Now, when they train, they're very interested in putting up big numbers. It's just to do with the whole showing off I'm more masculine than you, bollocks. Yeah. So there's a lot of single rep work done. Now, when you're artificially increasing your strength via drug use, but you're not doing any rep work to increase tendon strength, and tendon strength will always be way behind, you are setting yourself up for injury. Okay. Muscles will get stronger, a lot stronger, a lot faster than tendons do. Yeah. And that's one reason why negative work is so important, because it helps strengthen tendons. Mm. Okay. Okay, fascinating. Um, okay, so if we look at kind of gym culture, uh, do you feel that steroids have a place for the average gym goer? You know, if someone's not looking to compete or make a living from their physique, yeah, of course. Do you, so there is. You think the pros outweigh the cons? I think it's a personal risk decision. Okay. It's down to your own risk reward management system. I don't compete. I use, I use very high doses when I use. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, at this point in my life, 
five outweigh the risks. That will be shortly changing. I've already said to myself at the end of this year, I'm no longer going to run high doses because I'm 44 this year. Mm -hmm. I can't keep hammering high doses of drugs in me and expecting my body not at some point to go, whoa, fuck off, I've had enough. Mm. So I may have made a decision that at the end of this year, I'm going to go back to two short 12-week cycles a year of medium doses, medium to low doses. Um, if I haven't achieved the goals I want to achieve by the end of this year, then it's like, well, you know, at some point you've got to say you're not going to get there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you want that little bit of a boost, you've otherwise got a healthy lifestyle, you're sensible and you take reasonable precautions and there's nothing genetically weird about you when it comes to reactions to drugs, then you can use low-dose steroids or even medium-dose steroids with relative safety. There will always be risks. And I would never at any point say steroids are safe because they are not. But you can manage the risks. Um, and, you know, in the same way that if you want to go out, if you eat a healthy lifestyle all week and, and keep highly hydrated, then you can probably manage to go out on a Friday night and get absolutely slaughtered and the health impact won't be overly dramatic. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what it's about. You can have, I've always said this, if you're going to have poisons in your system, choose one and have one. So if your poison choice is steroids, then fine, then let that be it. Don't start putting recreational drugs in there. Don't start putting alcohol in there. Don't start putting pharmaceutical drugs in there on top of it. Mm -hmm. Because your body can't cope with it. Your body is amazingly adaptive and amazingly tolerant of a lot of crap we throw at it. Uh, and if you're going to use something that is potentially dangerous and toxic to your system, then just make sure that that's the only one and be aware of the warning signs. And be aware of what you've got to look for so that when it happens, you're not sat there thinking, oh, I just feel a bit rough today. You're sat there thinking, right, I feel a bit rough today. Why? What's causing this? Mm -hmm. Have I just got a bit cold? Or is there a bigger picture to this? So you're aware and you're looking at what's going on with your body so you can catch things early. And what are some of these warning signs, the early signs that things aren't up, aren't right? Sorry. With liver... Sorry, with kidney kidney valve, kidney work, it would be stuff like uh, frequent pissing or on, on, on an interrupted flow when you were pissing, those sort of things. Any sign of urine, which could mean there's blood in your urine, is an obvious sign you need to have a look. Um, some signs are just what they are. If you start getting acne, it's a side. That's what it is. The side is acne. It's not a precursor to anything worse. It's just acne. Mm -hmm. if you start getting headaches then you want to start getting your blood pressure checked if you find your blood pressure is, is sustained higher than normal for sustained periods of time then you, you know that there's going to be certain reactions going on within your body you already know about the cholesterol so it's important to get lipid values done on a regular basis uh, you need to be getting blood tests done on a regular basis definitely you want to get them done before you start your cycle so you have a baseline of what your natural levels are of everything sure but everybody's slightly different um, and then you know if you've returned to normal post cycle so if people are looking to get the testing where where do you send people Can I mean I can imagine I you can't to nip to your GP yeah I go to my GP okay I go to my GP and say I want, I want this done they, they may argue with you, but you have a right under the charter for unbiased medical care. Okay. And will they do, like, full blood chemistry profile? It's sometimes a bit difficult to get hormone profiles done. Right, okay. But getting your lipids, your liver function, your kidney function, and your serum levels, potassium, and all those levels done, that's easy. Because they're a standard blood test. That's what I thought, but... Surely people should be monitoring at some point in the year their what is happening to their full hormonal profile. Yes. Now there's two ways you can do this. You can go in and you can say, I've used steroids, I think I've screwed myself up. Can I have a hormone palate test? But then it will be marked on your record that you use steroids and next time you break your arm, the GP will go, That's because you use steroids. Yeah. Um, there are certain needle exchanges up and down the country that offer the service. I know Glasgow do, and I know Manchester do, and I believe Sheffield do as well. Um, or you can go in complaining of the symptoms of low testosterone. 
Okay, but surely that only gets you so far because really, let's say let someone's got a plan to take this for the next couple of years, you need to be regularly doing it and you can only use so many excuses once. You can, yes. You can, unfortunately. Uh, and in an ideal world, you'd be able to go to the doctor and say, look, I'm using this, this and this. I'm concerned about this. Can you check it? Uh, unfortunately, there is a large amount of biasness towards users and it can sometimes backfire in your face. So it will depend on your individual GP mm. and how open. When you get beyond GP status and start getting specialists, you generally find they're quite open-minded and okay. they're quite understanding. It just tends to be GPs that tend to be a bit old-fashioned and dogmatic about uh, usage. Needle exchanges is a good one, but it may mean you need to travel. But at the end of the day, is is a three hour journey worth worth your health? Sure. So and talking that. about kind of we're in this kind of medical realm. Uh, for someone that's taking this normal combination, you mentioned three uh, chemicals that someone would take. Do on average people have to take other things other than what you've already mentioned to manage possible side effects? So you mentioned the lipids that you would recommend taking something for that. Yeah, I mean, the main thing with, with, with usage would be estrogen management. So you'd be taking some form of estrogen control. You have three types. You have CIRM, selective estrogen receptor modulators, which are drugs that block the estrogen receptor. So that's Novodex, Tamoxifen. You have AIs, which are um, aromatize inhibitors. See, we don't actually produce estrogen. We produce an enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. Yeah. And AIs prevent the enzyme from being produced. So the main two are letrozole and arimidex. Letrozole being very, very powerful. And you have a nice little one called aromacin, which is a suicide inhibitor. And that binds to the aromatizer and makes it inert. Okay. So uh, you have options depending on how sensitive you are to estrogen and depending on how much of the drugs you are taking as to what you need to do to manage your estrogen levels. And there isn't a one-stop-fixes-all sort of thing, unfortunately. It's down to personal experience, monitoring, and just seeing how you go. Mm -hmm. um, now, with nandrolone sites uh, or prolactin sites, now, unfortunately, they are very similar to estrogen, so they're not always easy to spot. Now, medical theory states that if your estrogen is low enough, you cannot produce progesterone. But... I beg to differ because I think the, the human body has a way of finding its way around things. Mm. And if you're going to push <clears throat> one hormone through the roof, it will do everything it can to get its counter hormones up there as well because it wants to stay in balance. It wants to stay in homeostasis. Of course. Now, if you've got progesterone sides, you are looking at products like Prami or Kerberline. Unfortunately, they are very hard to get hold of. But most people don't suffer too badly with progesterone sides unless they're running very high dose nandrolones. So that's Deca, MPP, or Tremble. Okay. Uh, otherwise, drugs to take. There are drugs you can take that have supporting roles. Proviron is a very common one. Proviron is a slightly anti estrogenic drug. Um, now, what it does is sexual human binding, um, binding globule attaches to testosterone and helps with the conversion process to estrogen. What Proviron does, it has an affinity to SHBG, so it will bind up SHBG, making it inert and meaning it can't affect the testosterone, therefore increasing your levels of free-flowing testosterone in your system and reducing estrogen there. So Proviron is a, a drug that people quite often add in. On its own, it's a mild androgenic oral, a bit of a hardener, um, not really going to have any major impact on a physique on its own. Mm -hmm. But coupled with other drugs, it does seem to increase their efficiency because obviously it increases free flowing testosterone. Sure. Um, so there's bits and bats like that. Um, and it all depends, you know, the, the extra drugs that are taken are taken usually to manage the size that you, you manifest. If you don't manifest size, you don't take extra drugs. Okay. You mentioned briefly earlier about the cost of what this might entail for someone you know 30 70 pounds for the actual drugs and then some of the things to support that for someone that's doing it properly with taking everything to to do it uh, legit 
what what's someone looking at in terms of a monthly spend? That would depend on how friendly you are with your supplier. Okay. <laughs> um, retail values of a bottle of testosterone range between 25 and 45, depending on the brand and the quality of the drug and who you are and who you buy from. Um, wholesale values are nearer the 10 to 15 pound mark. Now, if you're buying enough, you're going to get wholesale pricing. Mm hmm um so your actual steroid element of it unless you're looking at my like, trembolones are quite expensive you'll be adding another 10 quid onto it for a trembolone uh anavar is very expensive oral kerber if you need to run kerber line is insanely expensive you'll be paying roughly somewhere in the region of five to seven pound a tablet wow and you take half a tablet every three days that is very expensive stuff. Um, if you're not running stuff like growth hormone, then the actual drug element of it, as in the, the, the steroid side of it, actually isn't that expensive. Mm -hmm. And you can get a pretty decent 14-week cycle for under a couple of hundred quid. Um, it's when you start adding in all the healthcare stuff and if you've got side effects. Mm. So, you know, I've... I've gone middle of the road and I've bought two bottles of testosterone. Well, two bottles of sustenon. So I've, I've spent £70 on two bottles of sustenon. That's going to allow me to do 500 milligrams of sustenon a week for 10 weeks. And I'm going to do uh, 300 milligram of Deca Durabolin alongside it. So I bought two bottles of Deca. That's cost me another 70 quid. And then there's my basic cycle. I'm going to run D bottles of Kickstarter for four weeks. So I spent another 35 quid, 40 quid on Dynaball. However, I've now decided I'm going to put my Viron in with that in order to increase the free floating test. So I'm going to be spending probably another 150 quid on Proviron. I now need some Novadex because I've got estrogen sides. So I'm going to be spending another 45, 60 quid on Novadex. I need my lipids to bill, three ones, that's £120. Because um, I'm running orals, I'm a bit worried about my liver, and I like a drink at a weekend, so I'm going to put some TUDCA in there. That's another £120 for the time. Cool. And then you start, right, okay, because I'm running Deca, I'm running Nandalon, I'm concerned about spermicidal mutation, I'm going to run Taurine, and then I've got to run some vitamin C, because all gear bursts from vitamin C, like there's no tomorrow. Um... And I need to run a multivit. I need to run a cod liver oil. And, and you know what a supplement is yeah. like anyway. Um, you put yourself on gear and you just put more stress on your system. Mm. So your support networks need to be better. Um, so, yeah, when you, the actual active drug part isn't that expensive. But when you start adding on all the healthy and safety precautions, then it can get quite expensive. And that's why a lot of people ignore them. Sure. And because then you've got to add the food on top. Yeah, you've got to have the food on top. My food bills, uh, my milk bill, bill alone, meat alone is over £100 a week. Yeah. You know, and when you start adding all this together, it gets very expensive. And and that's the thing. When you go to a guy and a guy says, right, I want to go on steroids, okay, and, and I've got 200 quid to spend on my cycle. Okay, well, you need to buy this, this, and this, and this, really, to keep yourself safe. Well, I've only got 200 quid. Well, then you're best not doing your cycle. They don't make that decision. No. They think... Well, my mate's done it, and he's been all right. Well, how do you know? Well, he says he is. He's still walking around. He's standing. Yeah. Has he been for a full medical? Do you know what his hormone levels are like? Do you know what his testicle function is like? Do you know what his heart function? Do you know what his ECG is? Mm -hmm. Do you know any of these things? Well, no. Well, then you don't know he's healthy. No, he could well be. And and you could go, and I know plenty of people that have used drugs at quite decent doses. I haven't run half of this safety stuff and for all intents and purposes do appear to be fine. Mm. But I'd always rather be safe than sorry because you can't go back and change it. No. When your bollocks stop working, your bollocks stop working. You know, you've got one heart, you've got one body, you need to look after it the best you can. And, and if running more expensive preventive medicines in order to do that is the case, then I would always hope that way. But for a lot of people, they do not feel that the expenditure is worth the return. And then they're down at A&E in 
two years time blaming that the roids have fucked their life mm. well hang on a minute mate did they really sure sure now, you will have to excuse me, everyone. Uh, very, very sorry, but I have cut this interview short. Well, I have for today anyway. Uh, the reason is me and Dave actually end up talking for another hour, and I couldn't put out a um, two-hour show. I've got to keep you excited. It's going to come out next week. So if you tune in next week, you will hear the second part of this episode where we go through a ton more on uh, steroids and its usage and all the questions that you have around it. Now, do me a massive favour. This episode is going to be of huge benefit to a lot of people. There's going to be a lot of people that have all sorts of questions surrounding this topic. Please share this episode with them. Let's not keep this information to ourselves. Let's share it around. Tag someone in the post on Facebook. Send it to them via email. This information needs to be shared. And when you see it on Facebook... Please give it a like, share it about, same on Twitter. And if you haven't done so, please leave me a review on iTunes because it helps the show grow. So I will see you next week when I will give you part two of mine and Dave's interview. See you next week. Hey everyone, Ben Cooper Radio, episode number 135. Um, I feel like I should do some kind of David Attenborough impression because... The lady opposite me is sitting in a fox animal onesie.